but I don't want to continue doing the same thing that I did. I'm really not interested in being a photographer that does the same thing for 30 years. I'm interested in doing 10 different things, uh, you know, failing at some, being good at others. And to, it's, I'm not really doing it for anyone else apart from myself. Street Unplugged by the Street Photo Collective Luxembourg. All right, hello to everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, new podcast. I would say it's a very special uh, podcast as we are recording just in front of the Luxembourg Street Photography Festival uh, in front of the Rotonde. And well, my name is Mark Oppelding, I'm a member of the Street Photography. Uh, collective Luxembourg and I'm joined by Veronique uh, Fixmer and uh, Patrick Hoffman also members of the collective and we have the great honor to welcome Matt Stewart hello Matt hello good morning <laughs> good morning how are you yeah feeling great uh, I mean the festival has been fantastic we had um, a great day yesterday we had um, uh, Julie Herdova talk which was one of the highlights for me and um, we had the French collective fragment, which uh, uh, was fragmented, <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm, uh, and then in the evening we all got together and we we uh, went to an amazing uh, African bar, uh, which sold um, fantastic food. We had curried goat, uh, yeah. and then uh, we we danced African style into the evening, which was uh, unexpected, but uh, you know, really just such a great night. So. For me, yesterday was the big highlight, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah. Well, for the listeners, we are recording here in the morning, so Matt is. Yeah, I, I have my uh, slight, slightly croaky <laughs> voice on. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe getting back to your to your conference. So for those that couldn't be there, uh, it was a fascinating conference and, and great talk, and and so I would be interested. Well. You showed some images, and, and as a kid you played music, and then as a teenager you were very into skateboarding. And how did you end up in, in street photography? So how, how did that come? Well, it's a good question. I think uh, it was linked uh, to the skateboarding, in a way. Um, I spent a lot of time on the street skateboarding. Um, you know, trying to make tricks on a skateboard in various places. Um, in London, I used to, to skateboard in the South Bank a lot, which is a sort of very urban uh, uh, skateboarding sort of mecca. Uh, and I used to, yeah. Eventually, I got better at skateboarding and, and people started to photograph me skateboarding, which was, um, uh, I guess, an introduction slightly to photography and the, the fascination of, of that and, you know, flashes going off and things. And um, anyway, uh, once I gave up the skateboarding, I uh, got a crappy job. Uh, the only job I could get was answering customer complaints in a, a call center, being shouted at every day of the week uh, and getting paid, but which is <laughs> not, not the, necessarily the best way to get paid. And um, my dad bought me a couple of books, one uh, by Robert Frank, uh, it's kind of an overview of Robert Frank, photo posh, and uh, one was a, an overview of Henri Cartier-Bresson, I think it was an aperture sort of monograph, best of Henri Cartier-Bresson, which <laughs> is like, uh, it's, uh, you know, Henri Cartier-Bresson's greatest hits is pretty remarkable. And uh, that was it, I, I kind of just fell in love with looking at these books and with whatever this type of photography was, and... Um, yeah, that was it. You know, uh, skateboarding died and photography uh, came into play. Matt, you, you spoke uh, yesterday during the conference about uh, the link between skateboarding and street photography and I, I, I found it very fascinating. Maybe you can dig a little bit deeper into this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, one of the things that I, I learned through the skateboarding is, is um, practice, which I, I, I know this sounds funny, but I, I learned so much uh, through skateboarding about life, uh, far more than I learned at school. Uh, I, uh, what skateboarding does, it, it's um, sort of an individual sport. You, you, it's not a team sport as such, but it's very democratic. You know, there's you know, 
rich kids, poor kids, black kids, white kids, uh, you know, girls, boys, everyone, just trying to skateboard. And uh, the the sort of support of each other is uh, fantastic. Um, but also the the learning and the repetition of of, uh, of d trying a trick, trying a trick, trying a trick, trying a trick, and every time you don't make the trick, you either kind of get pissed off or it hurts. Um, and this uh, really sets you up well for something as um, uh, as unpainful as photography uh, because you have to do exactly the same but when you don't make the trick it doesn't physically hurt obviously it mentally hurts um, but yeah and but also with the skateboarding you you have to learn to throw yourself down a flight of stairs um, and that's actually really quite a difficult thing to do is to sort of have the faith to just throw your body down on a pair of wheels that are not attached to, your, to, to you and hope that you land. Um, and it, it's a significant thing, I think, uh, to do that, to really just let yourself go. Um, and there's a definitely a connection between that and photography as well. Yeah, exactly. When I, mean, when I look at your, your images, and especially from all that life can afford uh, from the book, and I think there are about 80... Eighty images in the book, and and you mentioning trying, trying and missing, and trying and missing from skateboarding, and and so I would be interested how many. I asked the question yesterday, and uh, you you didn't answer it then. So so I'm going to reformulate it. How many weeks, months, years did you spend in the streets of London, walking there, mm. and trying to find those? 80 pictures that, that finally made it to the book. Well, actually, the new book's got 49 pictures. Okay. I got rid of. I got rid of. I got even more brutal. Um, uh, well, yeah, it, it was a an obsession, and and I love the planes coming <laughs> over. But I think it will be okay. Yeah, no, it's yeah, yeah. Um, it was an obsession, and um, and actually, well, I explain. Uh, obsession is a sort of is is quite a uh, romantic word. It's actually an addiction. Uh, to street photography, so uh, I would do it every day. Uh, I still, I mean, I do it as many days as I can now. I'm a father of two young boys, so I, you know, I have a few restrictions. But um, I would do it every day. I started in 1998, and when I was doing it very early on, I was extremely uh, addicted. Uh, I would do it every day, all day. But I had been doing skateboarding every day, all day, uh, which was far more physical. Um, really, really, you know, I would, and as, with the skateboarding, you kind of forget to eat and do all those teenage things that mm -hmm. are just stupid. But yeah, I, I would do eight hours a day every day. Yeah. Um, and I did that for from 2000, well, 1998 through to 2016. So that's quite a long time, what 18 kept, years. What kept you going? Generally, not so much the, the end product. Um, and it's a sort of a cliche, but it was definitely the journey, uh, not the destination. And so the walking, the going out and looking at people, listening to people, hoping, hoping um, um, in a positive way. It, and, it, and probably more, more than anything else, it was very good for my, my mental health. Um, you know, it, it just, it, you go out, uh, you, for a start, you do at least 20,000 steps a day and you... Um, hope and you, you you think about you, you empathize with scenes and situations the other thing that i think is so great sort of mentally with street photography is that, is that you're given these dilemmas in the moment and you have to make the decision of whether you do or you don't or you you know you try or you don't or do you take it or you don't or should you or could mm -hmm. you or would you and do you agree or do, do, and it's and you have to, it's, you don't, can't really think about it. You just have this sort of animal uh, instinct mm -hmm. to do it or don't, or why not, or why. And this can make you, I, I don't want to sound too holy, but make you a better person, you know, because you're making these, uh, these, these split second judgments, ethical judgments sometimes, or just uh, judgments about whether the rectangle goes here or there, whatever. I think it's good for you. Now you, you moved to the Netherlands a few years ago, so are you missing London? And can you find that same, I mean, that same atmosphere, also the same 
instincts? In uh, well, I mean, the so what happened with London is I did a book and then I thought, right, that's end, end of, <laughs> well, it's a book, but end of chapter. Uh, and um, uh, that 2016 uh, was a big sort of crazy year for me and uh, that was when Brexit happened and I, I got quite political, which I'd never really, I'd never really been in such a, a similar sort of in such a way you know Trump uh, happened and uh, Brexit happened and I actually found myself getting quite angry sort of angry most days and um, and so I just I guess yeah I had uh, it wasn't healthy for me there so I, I decided to leave with my partner Sue um, who's Dutch and we, we moved to the Netherlands uh, with our two little boys and uh, I haven't regretted the move at all. I have to say that the uh, there's less people, it's less busy, um, but I don't want to continue doing the same thing that I did. I'm really not interested in being a photographer that does the same thing for 30 years. I'm interested in doing 10 different things, uh, you know, failing at some, being good at others. And to, to, it's, I'm not really doing it for anyone else apart from myself and maybe my mum saying that she likes my pictures. <laughs> Matthew. We do as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about it's all about the mothers. <laughs> <coughs> Matt, in London, you 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 had uh, at least a long walk with Joel Meyerowitz. Yes. Can you uh, let us know a little bit more about this? Yeah, I can talk and uh, talk to you about him as well. Uh, so Joel has be become a good friend and and mentor over uh, the last 20 years or so. And ages ago, I think it was. I was sort of 2006, maybe. Yeah, 2006. I, w when I first uh, heard from him, I got an email from Joel saying, uh, "Matt, uh, uh, I love your work. We were in a in a in a magazine together called PDN, um, and he was on the front cover. I, I was one of I was a portfolio of 30 people, um, and um, he said, "I'm coming to London in a few weeks' time." You know, maybe we should get together and go and take pictures on the street, which kind of, you know, I don't know how old I, how old I was then, but uh, that's sort of like a dream. Uh, I think I was about 30, so getting that email was amazing in itself. But um, So I met up with Joel, who was very uh, fun and, you know, very kind and enthusiastic and very much a, uh, a supporter of young photographers, a uh, generous photographer, I mean, in my career, I've met many photographers, uh, mainly nice people, but some mo more generous than others, some not generous at all. Mm -hmm. And Joel is generous. And so we went for a walk around London, uh, took pictures together, you know, shot the breeze. And uh, and on the day that I was walking with Joel, I saw this uh, skip in front of the peacock, um, which uh, I've been walking past this peacock poster every day for about the last six months. And... You know, like waiting for a blue car to pass it, waiting for you know someone in a blue coat to pass it, or I don't know, just trying every, anything to get this picture. But anyway, on the day that I was with Joel, uh, there was a skip in front of it, and uh, it was pretty amazing, sort of going, Joel, look at that. Uh, on the day that I was walking with Joel, and uh, going, oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. It is amazing. I remember saying, "It's mine." <laughs> he was like, "Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You go for it." Um, but it was just a, almost a sort of climax of that amazing um, meeting. And uh, I've been very good friends with him ever since. He's um, he's in good health uh, and and still as generous and as supportive uh, a, 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 as he ever was. So, real top guy. Yeah. Cool. And what? When I look at your your pictures from from London, it, I mean I really see your character, your personality in them. I mean they were, I mean you not only have a sharp eye, you also have a very sharp mind, and you have a lot of well, humor and, and wittiness and and so as you well you 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 do know Joel Marovitz, you know all the kind of great photographers, uh, Martin Powered. So would you say that their work would reflect their personality? And is this something that you see in photographers, that there's some kind of link between what they photograph, what is it? Yeah, f definitely. Uh, 100%. I think um, 
I mean, I'm not going to start breaking down each of those photographers' no, no, no. personalities, but yeah, definitely uh, the type of person you are often reflects in what you see and what you think and uh, and how you see it. Maybe another um, project you had, uh, Tate Modern. Uh, how did this come? So was this an assignment or is it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. A, I have a, well, it's this kind of interesting story. Um, well, very early on in my um, career, I was taking black and white pictures, and I, uh, on the opening day of the Tate Modern, which is 300 years ago, uh, I went. I had. A, I got a, somehow. I got a press pass, and I went and uh, photographed in the museum and people looking at the museum. And you, at that time, you were not allowed to photograph in the museum, it, yeah. but it was a special day, so I had the authority to do so. And um, I took a picture of a man looking at with some Giacometti statues uh, as a black and white picture and um, I made early on in my uh, professional photography career I made four postcards one with the Millennium Wheel one with the lady asleep on the train one with the black and white dog and one with this Giacometti uh, mm -hmm. picture to try and get work you know I sent them out and um, I got a an email from the Tate Modern saying you're not allowed to uh, uh, use um, anything from the museum. <sighs> You're not allowed to take pictures in the museum. Anyway, I said, well, I, it was on the day that the museum opened and I was allowed to go and, you know, and, and I'm not selling the postcard, I'm just sending them out. Um, and uh, the lady replied, yeah, I, we actually do really quite like the picture. Um, so, you know, don't worry. In fact, you know, maybe you want to come and do some more of those pictures um, for us and uh, we give you the authority to take the pictures. So I, I said, yeah, sounds great. And uh, so I was commissioned to photograph in the Tate Modern for a year or two. Uh, it was very relaxed, uh, t to be absolutely honest. I wasn't paid very much money, but it was uh, something I would have done for free. And it, it, it culminated in a, a small exhibition at the Tate Modern of the pictures in the Tate Modern. So. I've had an exhibition in the Tate Modern, <laughs> um, and uh, but yeah, no, it's a it's a real it was a real privilege. But also, it's a, it's a it's quite nice in museums because, and it's actually to be honest, it's not a really difficult thing to do in museums. You, what you need to do is to really get to know the museum. It's exactly like the street; you need to really know every single corner, every single piece of light. But with the museum, you have to need to know every single piece of work, every single floor it's on, and so you just wait for people to come into the museum. And uh, you might see someone interesting and you kind of you sort of semi follow them or you go and wait by the piece of art that you think that they're going to correspond to mm. or, you know, and then every now and then there's some crazy thing happens, you know, like, I don't know, seeing this picture of the man stretching his back or the man pushing someone into hell. <laughs> uh, those pictures are, are, are obviously sort of um, more, sp maybe more special, but um yeah, that it's something anyone can do with a bit of patience and a bit of time, and as long as you're allowed to take pictures in the museum. I, I used to get a lot of trouble <laughs> even then from the security guards, and I'd you know, like, I have to show Bus. them the path. <laughs> but, that, but you did make me miss the picture for okay. telling me to stop taking pictures. Thank you so much. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, it was a fun job. Sure. And um, you were a Magnum nominee. Yes, yeah. And uh, how did that come? And how did it go? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, uh, the whole whole experience was good. I'm no longer in Magnum, so that's uh, I, I guess that's the quick answer. But um, uh, I got a very nice email from Mark Power, who is a very kind uh, man, nice friend, uh, who suggested I apply to Magnum. And I'd never thought of applying to Magnum. I didn't. I mean, I was a street photographer. I wasn't really on my list of things to do. But it was a very um, you know, nice offer. It's just after my book had been published, and so I applied, and I just got in. So to get a to become a nominee in Magnum, you need a 50-50 vote from all of the members, and uh, I think I got in with 51 votes, and so I was just in. And um, you know, I, uh, I spent two years uh, running around like a headless chicken. I didn't. It was kind of difficult for me because the um, book of my 12 years worth of work is what I got in on, and then you have two years to uh, do better than that. Okay. 
and it was never really going to happen. But uh, what I wanted to do uh, during that time was to, this was 2016, this is when Trump and all of this political stuff happened. I wanted to go and explore that and explore America. So off I went, I photographed the inauguration uh, with Larry Tal and Susan Mosales, you know, like, oh my God. <laughs> and uh, I had a great time there. Uh, I went, I followed Macron um, on his um, presidential uh, attempt, which was successful. Uh, I, I did ended up at various sort of catastrophic events like mass shootings in America, and was um, commissioned by Time Magazine to photograph the Vegas um, mass shooting. And yeah, I ran around and and did sort of more photojournalistic things, which I've always wanted to do. Um, and but I didn't really expect to go much further in in Magnum. And to be absolutely honest, um, I enjoyed the experience. Think the organisation was going through a difficult time, uh, and so I found it a little bit stressful, all in all. So I was kind of pleased to have got in, had a look, had a look behind the uh, the, the great uh, door of the Wizard of Oz, mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, yeah. But left. at the end of the day, do you think it influenced? It influences your work uh, still today. Uh, what Magnum? The Magnum, yeah. The uh, the fact that. You have been there, and it's maybe a different approach to to photography that comes comes to you. Does it does it still have nowadays an influence? I wouldn't say. To be absolutely absolutely honest, um, I mean, Magnum is a group of individuals. I don't actually see it as a as a as a group. So Magnum, no. But that some of the individuals definitely influence me, um, and you see, you learn how people work. You know, I was. Um, uh, working alongside people like Carolyn Drake, who I think is absolutely fantastic photographer and very different and a, a real unique voice in photography and see how she works. Um, uh, one of my very best friends is Trent Park and I've known him for 20 years and I know how he works and, uh, and the sort of level and energy that uh, you need to put into photography to really, really do it seriously and be really good at it. Um, so people like that, uh, you know, Richard Calvar, who was a very good friend, uh, Martin Parr, I mean, just to see the amount of work that Martin Parr did or does uh, is absolutely phenomenal. Not many people could, could work as hard as he works. So yeah, it's kind of inspiring. You, you, you realize that it's not just, you know, picking your camera up on a Saturday afternoon and taking it for a walk. It's like, you need to start thinking about projects. You need to start thinking about your approach. You need to start thinking about what, you know, where you're coming from. Uh, and all of these things you need to take quite seriously. But it was Trent Park who told you to give up black and white, is that right? No, I told myself <laughs> okay. to give up black and white after I saw Trent Park's work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was so good. it was so good that it kind of destroyed me. I was like, okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm get, taking off these black and white clothes because yeah, someone. So the Magnum yeah. people somehow influenced you then. Well, yeah, I mean, he, but he wasn't in Magnum then. I, I just okay. remember when I first met Trent and I saw, and we were we were corresponding with each other, uh, obviously on the internet. Uh, I just remember him. Sent, this was when he was absolutely. <laughs> on fire in Sydney and he would send you say oh I took this you know last week and it was like the white man picture I don't know if you've seen the you know the the, the white sort of kind of cut out looking ghost picture and then oh, he yeah. said and then yeah. he sent the yes. bus picture you know the, yes, exactly. the white bus yeah. coming yeah. and like <laughs> and on by email what do you think I'm like ah! <laughs> <laughs> amazing yeah no, a, real, a, a real a real inspiration and a, a great guy really great yeah. guy and well, maybe this transition from, from black and white to color, how much does color trigger you in terms of taking pictures in the streets of London, for example? Mm, yeah, color is a really, it's probably the first thing that I see. Okay. So, um, well, uh, if I'm, if there's not a significant moment happening, mm -hmm. color is the first thing I see. Significant moments happen rarely and then you're not really interested in, in the co you're just interested in capturing the significant moment w okay. and, ha and then hoping that the colors <laughs> correspond or are half decent. But I, I'm, uh, I find uh, photographing in color is important for me and that the pictures should be in some way colorful. Um, I don't really, uh, or at least, <laughs> well, in the book, there's a whole section that's pretty much black and white. But that's to do with the London weather, <laughs> you know. There's sort of there's a whole overcast, uh, you know, slightly 
nondescript section, mm -hmm. uh, which is in the middle of the book, which is hopefully the bit, part of the book that people forget. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, color is extremely important and uh, it is the first trigger. So if I see something colorful and, and the, the, there it has, there's potential for a good color picture, that, okay. that triggers me. Yeah, because also when you look at, at your work that you did for the book Into the Fire. Yes. It's, I mean, well, you can, can let our listeners know what, what it's about, but I think it's, it's a city that would really, many other photographers would have probably photographed it in black and white, to, probably to give this atmosphere. And what does color add to it? Well, I, yeah, I, I don't know if I agree with you there. I think okay. potentially it, would, it, it, it lends itself to color. Um, yeah, I haven't actually thought about it, but um, I would never go back to photographing that kind of place in black and white. Um, and at that point in my, and still in my career, I'm color photographer. Okay. Although every now and then I photograph my family in black and white, but I keep that secret. <laughs> Can you maybe just elaborate a little bit on, on the project? Was this oh, also yeah, done yeah. For, Slab, for, for Slab City. This was my um, uh, the work that I submitted. I could have actually yes. submitted uh, and retrospectively potentially, like I say, I'm actually pleased not to be involved <laughs> anymore. So uh, I'm pleased that this work didn't get through. I could have, I was doing a big lot of work on America and could have shown lots of America. Um, but I still don't quite frankly think that would have been enough. I think there's all sorts of, politics and weird and wonderful things going on in Magnum that um, probably, you know, add to uh, people's decisions. Mm -hmm. But um, the Slab City work was that final project and it, it it took four months and to be absolutely honest, I really went for it. I, you know, lived in a van. Uh, I, um, you know, experienced a lot of things that most people would never ever experience or want to experience or I don't know I, I kind of went for it I had a sort of um, yeah let's totally completely experience this place as authentically as I possibly can although I'm always going to be someone who can leave uh, which I was very aware of um, and yeah it's it's in the American desert it's a squatter camp apparently the last free place in America but it's probably not and uh, uh, all sorts of um, wonderful and weird people live there uh, in equal amounts. I, I have a question in regards to this. Um, it's maybe something more uh, a philosophical question. Is is your Slap City work still a street photography work, or is it more documentary work? And and maybe how do these two things collide? Really collide? great question. Yeah. So for. You know, street photography, what is street photography? You can look up Wikipedia, you can listen to lots of people telling you what street photography is to them. Street photography for me is whatever you want it to be. And the, and yes, the, you know, the next argument, well, in that case, it's just photography. <laughs> no. Um, so I think it's about, um, it, it's about authentically being yourself in a public place, whether you are taking candid pictures, whether you, if you want to interact with people, as long as these are, you know, genuine uh, interactions in some way, it's street photography for me. Um, and that's my interpretation of it. It's not my, it's not the definition of it, because like I say, there's so many, you know, people who can, uh, you know, have access to Wikipedia and say what they say, but there's, it's very hard to define. It's like street skateboarding and in skateboarding, for instance, street skateboarding, it would be absolutely ridiculous to say, well, you know, really, I, I mean, if you're wearing pads, it's not really street, is it? It's not really, like, pads is not street. And, like, if you're wearing a helmet, that's not street. Uh, and uh, and if you're going to do, like, if you're going to, you know, you know um, do a flip on the street, well, it's not really that street, really, is it? You know, it's like, shut up. Just go off, go out and do whatever you do. Stop trying to define it. Bring it back. If it makes you happy, if you if, it, if 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 you're proud of it, you know, that's that's you. 
Thanks. Okay, and and it's just really important to say that because there's a, a, there's a lot of there's a lot of angry men sitting by their computers going, "Well, wow, that's absolutely ridiculous." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, there's some people who are like, you know, if it's if it's black and white, it's not street. If it's flash, it's not street. If it's you know, shut up. Go, why don't you just go and take some pictures? <laughs> thanks, thanks for the fantastic answer, man. <laughs> it's okay. Just, well, but by the, by the way, slab is slab city street. It's the, it's a mixture of you know. Uh, candid photographs, uh, interactions I had with people, portraits, landscapes, it's a bit of everything. Do you think your, your photography is different from if you're picturing complete strangers in the street like, like you did in London, mm -hmm. from picturing people that you have been living well, that you have been living with kind of six months? Mm. Is your is your approach, is your picture are your pictures different? Well The, the thing with what was so interesting, and this is one of the reasons I was so pleased to find this place, is that Slab City had, you know, a maximum of a thousand people living there, minimum of about 200, uh, depending on the, the, the time of the year. Um, and so you would have to get to know the people who live in this mm -hmm. small town, whereas with London, which has, I don't know, eight million people in it, very difficult to try to get to know everyone. <laughs> so um, just by the geography and the popu populace, you get to know the people. And then you're in. Uh, and so, yes, you can take candid photographs of people that you know uh, or have or know of or have you know passed in the street or, or whatever. And they know that there's some weird English guy with a camera hanging around and, with, and to avoid him or not. Um, and so just by, by how it is there, you, you do have to get to know people. And quite frankly, if you just turned up at Slab City and started taking candid pictures of everyone, you'd last, you know, a couple of days. <laughs> uh, any, any new projects? Yeah, lots of projects. I mean, this is one of the things that I definitely, uh, that I learnt um, at Magnum is from some of the younger photographers, quite dynamic. Um, uh, Christina de Middle, for instance, who I, I like very much, she has maybe six projects running at, okay. at, at one time. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is a good way to um, be productive, but also to avoid burnout from one project. So I have uh, all sorts, I have projects that, that, you know, might fly and there's projects that might die. So I have, um, at the moment, I've suddenly uh, got an idea uh, in the Netherlands to photograph from train platforms, um, meaning I go to uh, a different train station every day and then I photograph uh, out, out of the train platform. So the platform is the constraint and the location and I photograph the landscape either way. Uh, and so the, the platform controls what I see to a certain extent, but I have to, I'm going to only find really good platforms, so, but that will involve quite a few train journeys. Okay. And the ultimate goal of your project, is it to publish a book? Or is it yeah, a book is always um, kind of my, 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 the best way for me to see photographs. I love photo books. I have a big photo book collection. Uh, I'm, My dad was a graphic designer, so I have an interest in graphic design, and um, I, I enjoy working with graphic designers. I'm working a lot with a young uh, graphic designer in London uh, called Tom, and uh, he has, you know, that young creative energy which I feed off, and uh, you know, I shout and rant at him, and he kind of feeds off that as well. So I enjoy the process of making books, um, and yeah, the ex, uh, you know, and people who the the book is intimate. Uh, and you know you can look at a book, you know, in your kitchen, sitting on the toilet, you know, whatever you want. And uh, I, I find that the best way to experience photography, not sitting on the toilet, but just you know, with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas an exhibition, I find it kind of. Um, uh, although exhibitions are great, uh, I just uh, I prefer the intimacy and the quiet of a book. Okay, and that's a good way to to close a project. As, as well, I would say. Or Absolutely, yeah, and and it's sort of it's a great container for photogra photographs, you know, and it, it's uh, it, 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 and the book never goes away, whereas the exhibition lasts for a month or two months or three months and then it goes. The book is and this way and it's the other thing with books, it's kind of kind of uh, scary. Like if you mess up the book, it's there forever, <laughs> so don't mess up the book. Um, and I I think res really respecting the book and how it, yeah, I mean, people are still respecting the Bible. Been around for a long time. 
what, what would happen if that book didn't exist? You know, maybe, <laughs> well, let's not go there. But anyway, uh, you know, book is important. Okay. And um, uh, do you, when you taking, are you when you are taking pictures, do you think about the book already, or? Uh, great question. Yeah. Uh, so the the work that I'm photographing in the industrial park um, is only I only thought about the book. I wanted to make a colourful, extremely colourful book, and it to be you know graphic and uh, uh, some of the pictures I've photographed so that the line in the middle splits over a double page spread I want to make that book with uh, no um, it will be double page spreads but there's going to be no visible uh, gutter mm -hmm. so they, they will open flat uh, and be just very big um, colorful blocks and that that work is just only about the book uh, whereas the all that life can afford work the sequence is extremely important but the the book is just a receptacle it's not not a design it's not there's no design you know extra design around the pictures or anything but yeah the colorful work is is really shot for a book when is this coming out uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well it's interesting the the, the the work semi uh has a it, it, it is mondrian the steel uh lead and uh, it's 150 years since he died this year. So I'm, I have this kind of like, mm, maybe I should hurry up. And so I'm, I am starting to, to work on that, to maybe have it done before Christmas. Great. Any questions, Patrick? Yeah, let, tell us a little bit about your book, uh, Think uh, Like a Street Photographer. Oh, yes, yes, um, yeah. I think it's inspiring for a lot of uh, street photographers outside. So. Yeah, Give well, th th this happened uh, maybe um, uh, 2019. I was, uh, Joel Myrovitz, who's a kind and generous man, uh, suggested to his publisher who was publishing his book that they maybe look at my work and to have a sort of a younger person um, point of view. And anyway, so off I went and I met Lawrence King, the publisher of Bystander, which is his great... Uh, you know, street photography book. And so we started talking about how we could make it slightly different. And uh, I met a great writer, a lady called Gemma Pedley, a very dynamic and energetic uh, young lady. And we, w we would go out walking and taking pictures and I would explain how I felt and, you know, what I was, what I was doing. And I, I had this kind of, um, you, you know, the scene in Amelie with the blind man where she grabs the blind man and she says, you know, smell this, yep. we're going past the market. You know, taking a breath, and this is red. But I know, you know, I kind of did that with Gemma, not that in any way that she's blind, but she had never done street photography, and so I just kind of said, let's go, mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah, pushed her comfort zone, maybe, Good. and she, she totally got it. And so she did an initial kind of uh, segregation of the chapters and, you know, what we should, how we can split it and da-da-da-da-da, because I don't have that kind of brain. And she wrote stuff, uh, which some of it which was great, and some of it was okay, you know, because that's always the way it was. A, and and uh, then I changed things and we were almost ready to publish it. And then COVID hit and the publisher completely shelved most projects, which actually gave me about a year and a half to really refine the book. So COVID in a way was a, um, a blessing for this particular book because I'm, I made it better, uh, rearranged the pictures and thought a lot about the edit and tone of voice. And it, it, it's done quite well. Uh, it's sold over 10,000 copies. It's published in four different languages. And um, I'm, oh yeah, I'm proud of it. Uh, and uh, it, it's definitely very good for, for new photographers to um, hopefully get inspired by and maybe even photographers who <laughs> have been doing it for a while I don't know that's but great it's great yeah. to, to see how Matt Stewart thinks <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> well yeah it's uh, yes I, I'm pleased that Gemma was able to make it coherent <laughs> <laughs> okay I think we're running out of time a little bit and you have to leave yeah no go, it's been, it's been it home. has so been such a, a great pleasure and really one of the best festivals that I've been to that's very um, good. and uh, I hope uh, that you, you know, keep on going and next year is is even bigger and better but really okay. great energy here and, and it's the amount of people that walked through the door was really overwhelming I was like wow <laughs> street photography is popular uh, so thank you so much I, oh, I really thank appreciate you. Thank it you. Thank it's you. really great having you thank you very much Matt. take care cheers thank you cheers